name is Maddie and I am a second year, second year Commerce Advanced Studies student. Last week we looked at how Jesus prepared his disciples for a world that is opposed to him, to, opposed to them, providing them with hope so that we too are prepared for when the world is against us. I was comforted and encouraged by the idea that Jesus personally cares for us through the Holy Spirit and that our problems in this life are labour pains that ultimately lead to the joy and glorification of Christ. So this week's Bible reading is from the Gospel of John, and it's the whole of chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I prayed for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want, I want those you who have, well, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. All right, thank you. And, um, I must apologize, something is not technically right with this room. We've had trouble with the lighting and last week we could get the lights on and we'd really like to turn the lights up a bit higher but um, today it's not working so sorry about that. Um, I guess that's one good thing about having a glowing screen in front of you. (laughs) Um, Well, a lot of us have life admin tasks and I find, is this a bit too loud? I don't know. Um, A lot of us have life admin tasks that we need to get on top of. One of the ones that I need to get on top of is writing a will. Now, of course, it's a task that never feels urgent. Hang on, I'm just going to try to reduce the ringing in the system. All right, test, test, test. That's a bit better, isn't it? Let's start again. Um, welcome or welcome back to public meetings and um, you know we all have life admin tasks that we have to get on top of one of them is writing a will and uh, you know that doesn't feel like an urgent task but it is very important according to all the online articles and it's very easy and 
everyone should have one, apparently. Thanks, Zoe. Um, so I went looking for how to write a will, and this is how you do it. Number one, title your will document, last will and te testament. Start with this will dated with today's date. Then this is made by me, your full name, address, occupation. List the full names of your executors with their addresses and relationship to you. List any non-monetary gifts and the beneficiaries who will receive them. List any monetary gifts and charity donations and the beneficiaries, beneficiaries who will receive them. And add the full name of your primary beneficiary, their address and relationship to you. List the full names of your two witnesses, their addresses and occupations. Sign your will in front of your witnesses and initial each page. Now, why am I telling you all of this? Well, the reason why wills are important is because they tell us your desires. What you wanted to happen where after you've died and you're not around to be asked. And so we've been looking at the second half of John's Gospel, where we just started 24 hours before Jesus' death on the cross. And Jesus has been giving his disciples instructions and teaching about what they need to know and understand before he goes to his death. Now, it's important because if he hadn't said anything, then it would be very confusing because his death was the death of a criminal. His earthly life and ministry were very short. How, would, how should we interpret what was happening? How would we know what he really wanted? Well, now we come to the last words of Jesus before he gets arrested and taken away. And in fact, they're a prayer to God. And in a way, this is like Jesus' will. He reveals to us a window into the things that he really wanted. These are the things that he really desired that his death and resurrection would achieve and lead to. And so what we're looking at is really profound in its significance because we get a window into what Jesus asked for, what he prayed for. And it's strikingly relevant and personal for us as well because we'll see that he prays for us in his prayer as well. Now you might be able to see, in, if you've got the Bible in front of you, that Jesus has his prayer in three main sections. In verses 1 to 5, he prays for himself. And then in verses 6 to 19, he expands his prayer out to his disciples. And in verses 20 to 26, he prays for all future believers. And so we'll tackle the text in those three sections. Now, um, the first thing that Jesus asks for is about himself, and he's about to go to his death, and he asks for his own glory. Have a look in your Bibles, verses 1 to 5. Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you've given here. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I've brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. Now, there's a few things to explain here. What is glory? What does it mean to glorify someone? And what's eternal life? And all of these are important questions. So let's ask them, what's glory? Well, glory is the beauty and worth of heaven. It's the idea of God's own majesty and splendor. The Hebrew word used in the Old Testament for God's glory is associated with weightiness. It's like God is laden with riches. And it's a word that's associated, I guess, with this overpowering radiance, like the light that somehow manages to shine out of a pirate's treasure chest. Um, that's glory. And it's all associated with honor and authority and power. So then what does it mean to glorify someone? Well, to glorify someone is to honor them through praise or by placing them in, a, in an exalted position. Now, Jesus is glorified because he's raised up to a position of honor, sitting at God's right hand, given authority to rule. It's for him to be laden with riches and for him to receive praises. Now, when Jesus says he had glory with his Father before the world began, well, that means that even before we were a twinkle in God's eye, the Son and the Father were glorifying one another. They were full of uh, majesty and splendor, laden with riches, full of honor and praise. And when Jesus 
What Jesus must be saying is that he had all that glory in the beginning with the Father, and yet he had to give it up. In order to be born into this world, he had to lay all of that aside. He left his throne, he took off his robes, his beauty, his wealth, his honored position, all of that. He gave it all up to become a human being, to wash feet. But now, as he went to his death and resurrection, what was happening? From a Roman point of view, he was being humiliated. But from his point of view, he was being exalted, lifted up, honored, even on the cross. And at his resurrection and ascension, he returned to the Father. And he would take up again the glory that he had at the beginning. Now notice that the greatest glory is to glorify another. The Father glorifies Jesus by giving him all authority. Um, And Jesus' work is to glorify the Father by doing his work. And he glorifies us by giving us eternal life. So what's eternal life? Eternal life is life in the kingdom of God. It's not just about living forever, even though that seems to be pretty straightforwardly what it also means. But Have a look at verse 3. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. It's about knowing God. It's primarily about experiencing relationship, Um, relationship with God, not just the length of your life. It would be useless to live forever if you did not experience true satisfaction. Living forever and not knowing God is a life of endless monotony, or worse, it's a life of endless tragedy. But the prophets promised that one day, we wouldn't always need to be teaching other what God is like, because all of us would just know him. From the least of us to the greatest, Jesus was saying that he was granting that kind of life, that we would know God. Not the shadowy, sin-stained life in that we experience in this world, but real life, eternal life in the kingdom of God. You see, the way that we think about it is all backwards. You know, we think that normal life today is what matters, what has significance. And we have this conception that eternal life must be this ghostly spiritual presence in the future, like Casper the Friendly Ghost. But the Bible's view is the opposite. The life that is really there, oh, I'm sorry, this life is really there. We're not living in a simulation, but it's not exactly the, um, the genuine thing either. Life as we know it is kind of the cheap knockoff version, the Audi version of the genuine article. And those of us who've never experienced the kind of life that Jesus has to offer are always wondering what the big deal is. Well, you know, can it really be that much better? But yes, there is a difference, and yes, it is that much better, and it's not even close. Like, real gold is infinitely more worth, more worthy than fake gold. So is eternal life to life as we experience it without God. Now look at this. The glory of the Father is to glorify the Son, and the glory of the Son is to glorify the Father and to give us eternal life, which is, uh, which is the knowledge of only true God. What about our glory? Our glory, likewise, is to glorify another, namely Jesus. Our main job description is to honor him. And we do that through praise, and we do that by placing him in the most exalted position in our lives. So we praise him in song, but we also praise him in our speech. We praise him to one another. We praise him to ourselves. We praise him among the nations. And we also need to allow him to be that beautiful, worthy king that he really is in our lives. And that means letting him occupy the God seat. And that usually means kicking ourselves out of that seat and saying, stop trying to run your life, self. Someone much better qualified is here. And so let's let him be in charge. Now, this is the true meaning of beauty and worth. Don't you want to be beautiful? We don't chase after the cheap Aldi version of beautiful, which is just how your body looks. Seek to magnify God's beauty, and you'll f- you have the most fulfilling beauty in the world. Don't you want to have significance? 
Well, don't go after the cheap knockoff version of significance, which is being loved for your career and money and success. Bring, bring praise to God, and you'll have deeper meaning than money can ever buy. Great glory is to glorify another. Our greatest glory is to glorify God. Now, let's move on to the second part of Jesus' prayer. Notice how in verses 6 to 19, Jesus brings a third party into the picture. It's not just about him and his father, but he says in verse 9, I pray for them. He's talking about his disciples. Now, I want you to do some work with the person next to you. Have a look down at verses 6 to 19 and see if you can identify the key words that tell us what Jesus is actually praying for. So what we're looking for are grammatical imperatives, like the words where Jesus says, do this, God. Okay, so I'll give you a minute. With the person next to you, what are the imperatives that God, that Jesus is praying in verses 6 to 19? All right, how are you going? I know it's not a lot of time, uh, but uh, let's have a look together. Did you find them? There are two main verbs that tell us what Jesus is asking his father for. The first one is protect them in verse 11, and your translation might have keep them or guard them. And the second one is sanctify them in uh, verse 17. And so you might also have picked up um, that in verse uh, 15, Jesus says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil ones. So that idea of protection again. So let's have a look at, closer look at what's going on for each of these, um, uh, uh, these prayers. Jesus first prays that his disciples have a relationship. Uh, says, he says that his disciples have a relationship with God. He has revealed God to them. They belong to God. They were given to Jesus. They've obeyed God's word. Now, 1 Corinthians 6 says that you are not your own. You were bought with a price. We belong to God. And here the fact that we belong to God is authenticated by the fact that we know and we believe that Jesus came from God. In a sense, Jesus is saying, God, these are your people. You had better look after them. If we don't look after our things, then they can get lost or they might break. Well, if God doesn't look after us, then we might get lost. We might break. The reality is that Jesus is going to the Father, but his disciples are staying in the world. That's why they need protection. Verse 11 says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Now, what does it mean to be protected by the power of God's name? Now, it's not a magic spell. You can't just say, Jesus, like, Expelliarmus! <laughs> right? And make evil go away. The name of God is very significant in the Bible. And there are a couple of significant stories in the book of Exodus that help us to understand the significance of God's name. At the very beginning of the book of Exodus, God calls to Moses out of the burning bush. You might remember that story. And when God uh, talks to Moses, Moses says, what should I call you? What should I tell the people your name is? And God says, I am who I am. Tell the people, I am has sent you. So he call, uses this name, I am. And that's the, where the word Yahweh comes from. When the Old Testament, um, you know, in your Old Testament Bible, you might see the word Lord in capital letters. That is the way that the Old Testament translators are telling us that in the Hebrew text, it's written the word that is God's name, Yahweh. And, uh, and Yahweh is basically a form of the words I am uh, that God used to introduce himself to Moses. 
Now, that's extremely significant for John's gospel because you might know that in John's gospel, there are all these I am statements, seven of them, in fact. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd and so on. In each case, Jesus uses an emphatic form of those words, I am, in Greek. But even more striking than, uh, than those I am statements are the couple of times that Jesus just says, I am, and doesn't follow it up with anything else. He just says, I am. And when he says that in chapter 8, the Jews pick up stones to stone him because they realize what he's saying. He's claiming to be God himself. Now, that's one story about God's name being revealed to Moses. The other story that's really significant in the book of Exodus about God's name is there's this moment when um, uh, Moses wants to see God's glory. And God says, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you, and I will declare to you my name. And that's exactly what happens. The glory of God passes by Moses, and, um, and he announces his name like this. He says, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. And he goes on. But what we see here is that God's name is associated with his character of love and faithfulness and grace and so on. So to be protected by God's name is to be protected by God's godness of who he is. And the effect of being protected is that we would be one. The disciples were, um, were not 11. <laughs> the Christians in the world are not 2.3 billion. When we belong to God, we're one. And uh, we'll come back to this point in a, little, in a little bit. When Jesus prays for his disciples, he prays for their protection because there are dangers in the world. And so we must be mindful of dangers that we face to our faith. Because there are some who've sat in EU public meetings like you in the past, and in, they have given up their faith because they couldn't accept Jesus' teaching about taking up their cross to follow him. There are some who have withered in their faith because when hardship came along that they didn't expect, they discovered that they had no deep roots to anchor them. And there are some who have been choked out of the faith because they've allowed themselves to be overwhelmed by the priorities of the world. And they chase after achievement and career and trying to make a name for themselves. Uh, when I was a student, I didn't understand politics and I didn't really, wasn't really interested or invested in it. As I've gotten older, I think I've become a little more interested, partly because I think I understand a bit more the issues and what's at stake, but I am alarmed at, the, um, at some parts of the church. And I'm thinking um, particularly of uh, some of the influence of the American evangelical scene, but um, it happens elsewhere. Um, but some parts of the church are being consumed by worldly politics. And it can be true on the left and on the right, and it's equally dangerous. Uh, we must let Jesus be Lord, not politics, not power, not tribal identity, and not fear. Some have let go of their trust in God without even realizing it. We need Jesus' prayer. Lord, protect us by the power of your name, by the power of who you are, and by the truth and grace of your character. But we said there were two things, two imperatives. One was protect them, and the other one is sanctify them. And so the word sanctify, uh, or the word consecrate, it means to make something holy. And you might know that the, the root idea of holiness in the Bible is the idea of being set apart, um, dedicated for a purpose, and particularly for the service of God. Now imagine that you want to clean your shower. And you don't want to just do a, you know, just a surface level job. You want to really clean your shower right down to the, you know, lines of grout between the tiles. And so you might use a toothbrush to scrape the grout between the tiles. But would you use the toothbrush that you used to brush your teeth this morning? 
No, of <laughs> course not. Uh, I used an electric toothbrush this morning. Maybe an electric toothbrush would do a better job. But no, it would not be a good idea. You would never use the toothbrush that you use for brushing your teeth for cleaning your shower because the one is set apart. It's dedicated for a purpose. It's holy. And if you were to use that toothbrush that you use to brush your mouth on the shower, it would be defiled. It would no longer be fit for purpose. Well, just like that, we are sanctified, set apart and made holy by God's word. And that's because we have a task. Our task is to continue Jesus's task. He says, as you've sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. He's gone to be with his father and we are the ones in the world sent with the same mission that Jesus had. In a sense, we are all missionaries. We are all, in a sense, apostles. Missionary and apostle, they both come from words that mean sent one. Well, Jesus had asked God to sanctify his disciples so that they would continue his work as we are sent into the world. And Jesus prays, if Jesus prays for it, then we had better pay attention. The truth is that we have work to do. We've been dedicated for the service of God. And the primary tool that we have in our work is the word of God. The word of God is what protects us. It is the thing that shows us the way to go. It is what draws others to Jesus and it's what grows people to maturity in Christ. That's why we sit under the word of God in our public meetings. That's why we open up the word in our small groups and in our one-to-ones. This is why we want everyone to be trained to read the Bible rightly. This is why we would love everyone to invite someone to read Uncover with a friend. We've used a few different versions of Uncover in the past. And if you don't know what it is, it's basically one of the Gospels, um, just in a pocketbook format. And it's designed for you to read with a friend. Now, a couple of years ago, an EUer made the bold step of inviting a friend to read the Gospel of Mark. It was Uncover Mark at the time uh, with him. And as this friend met Jesus in the pages of Mark's gospel, he became a Christian. And he kept growing and growing as he learned from God's word and he joined in EU activities. And last year, he graduated from the EU after serving as one of our faculty leaders. God's word does its work. And that's why we want, our, we want to get ourselves and our friends in front of it. Now, could you be bold? I know it can be a bit scary. It's not our job, though, to make our friends say yes. You know, they, we can just make the invitation and they can say yes or no. So why don't you say to a friend, it doesn't matter if they're a brand new friend or a longtime friend, you say, hey, I'm part of this group called the EU and we're doing a thing this year where we're inviting our friends to read the Gospel of John with us. Would you be read, interested in reading the Bible with me? And honestly, it's okay if your friend says no. But let's just not, not, don't just assume that, because maybe they will say yes. And it could be that if you ask five people, one of them will say yes. And maybe you'll get to help them to get to see Jesus for themselves. And wouldn't that be wonderful? Jesus prayed for his disciples. We're protected by God's name, and we're set apart for God's service. Now, Jesus prayed for himself, and uh, he prayed for his disciples. And now this is how we know that we can apply his prayer to us ourselves, because he prays for all future believers. Have a look down at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message. Jesus' expectation is that there will be generations of future believers, people who have not seen him directly, they haven't been healed in one of his miracles or felt his hands washing their feet, but they've heard the message and that was passed on from his disciples and they've come to faith. And the things Jesus says about what he really wants, he truly desires, they're absolutely staggering. He says that we can share in the unity of God, we can share in the glory of God, and we can share in the love of God. This is amazing. Now, first he picks up on the theme of unity again. He prays in verse 21 that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Now, do you realize what is happening here? 
we are being invited to share in the life of the Godhead. When Jesus says he is in the Father and the Father is in him, he's talking about this relationship of unparalleled intimacy in mutuality and love for all eternity. The Son rejoiced in the Father, but the Father rejoiced in the Son. And Jesus wants us to have that kind of unity. But Jesus goes on to say, may they also be in us. Now there's real inclusion here. It's not just that Christians are united by, um, because they like the same kind of music. It's not just that we have unity because we, have, we speak the same language or we wear the same clothes or that we all love the same TV shows or the same, we like the same flavor of ice cream. Our unity comes from union with God. We're united to each other because we're included in the unity of God himself. And you might notice that this has an impact on the world. He says in that same verse, so that the world may believe that you sent me. When we share in that unity of God, when we are united with God and to one another through God, then there are people in the world who will see us and say, I want what they've got. I have a friend at church who became a Christian a bit later in life. And she would say, look, I always had friends. I never had trouble making friends. But when I started to have Christian friends, I thought, I've never had friends like this. That is what the world should experience in us if we follow Christ. Now, look down to verse 22. He says, I've given them the glory that you gave me. I've given them the glory you gave me. If our jaws have not fallen on the floor, we have not yet understood the magnitude of what Jesus is saying. We have Jesus' glory. All of the splendor that he had in eternity in heaven, he's given it to us. All of the status, the position, the honor that he has before his father, He's given it to us. He shared it with us. We're lovely because he's loved us. We're beautiful because he's seen us. We're significant because he's exalted us. And now put your finger on the last half of verse 23. He says, Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. We have the same love as the Father has for his own Son. The most passionate, exquisite love that we have in this world can barely hold a candle to the supernova of the love of God that has existed since before the beginning of the time. And that is the kind of love that we are now included in as followers of Jesus. There's a long theological um, tradition of uh, Christian thinkers who have understood the pro basic problem that we have as being uh, one of disordered loves. You see, so it's not that loving your work is a bad thing, it's a good thing. But if you love your work more than you love God, then your loves are out of order. It's not that loving your family is a bad thing. Loving your you probably should love your family more than you do right now. But if you love your family more than you love God, then your loves are out of order. And because the love of God surpasses all other things in the world um, that might love us, our love for God must surpass uh, all, uh, our love for all other things in the world. But if we truly do love God more and more, the result will not be that we love other things less. It actually will be that we love them more rightly than ever before. What does that mean? It means that we can have unity, glory, love, far surpassing anything that we've ever dreamed if we have union with God. Now, if you chase directly after love or glory or even the unity of the church, then you will likely go the wrong way, like a train running without tracks. But let it be our aim to dwell in Christ, to behold his glory, to know him and his love, to bring him praise with our lips and in our lives, to say to God with the psalmist, better is one day in your courts, than a thousand elsewhere. Let us pursue God with single-minded devotion because it is when we finally see him face to face 
that we will be fully and completely satisfied. When Jesus prayed for us, he prayed that we would be fully included in the unity, glory, and love of God himself. These have been Jesus' final words. Uh, A statement and prayer of his heart's desire before he goes to his death and resurrection. He prays for glory as the one who's glorified God and given us eternal life. He prays for our protection and sanctification as we're sent with his mission into the world. And he prays that we would share in the very life, love, and glory of God himself. Jesus' prayer can be answered because of what he says in verse 19. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. We can glorify him, we can be on mission, we can be included, because Jesus sanctified himself, because he set himself apart, because he finished the work that he came to do. In going to the cross, Jesus opened up the way for every blessing to come down from heaven so that we can experience joy and peace. And when he returns, we will behold his glory and be fully satisfied. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you prayed that you would be glorified that we would be protected, and that we would share in your unity and glory and love. You went to the cross in order that we might have access to the answer to your prayer. Help us, therefore, to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to find ourselves fully satisfied as we behold your glory. Amen. Thanks for listening to today's talk. The Evangelical Union, or EU, is a student club on campus at Sydney University that seeks to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. To join us or to find out more, please visit sydneyuneeu.org.